Hello and welcome to Exploring the Hidden Costs of Data Friction. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, uh, it's a pleasure to be here today with uh, David Daniels, our CEO and founder of the Relevancy Group, Jeannie Mullen, Principal Analyst of the Relevancy Group, and Will Devlin, VP of Marketing from Message Gears. Will, uh, thank you and thank Message Gears for, for sponsoring this research. Yeah, Nick, thank you. I appreciate uh, everyone joining today. Just uh, give a quick quick context on who Message Gears is so we have uh, some background. Uh, we're, we're a cross-channel customer engagement platform for what we call super senders. So we, we generally work with some of the largest uh, brands, consumer-facing brands in the world that send tens of or hundreds of millions of emails a month uh, and find ways for them to uh, to personalize at scale and to to create relevance and, and necessity at scale. Uh, our, our differentiators uh, we'll get into a little bit later about uh, we, we directly access data wherever it lives. So you don't have to map, sync, or copy data. Uh, we work with clients like uh, Expedia, Rakuten Rewards, uh, which was formerly Ebates, uh, Chick-fil-A, Amtrust, uh, and, and we've been around for for uh, about nine years now. So uh, really happy to, um, to to be here. And and thanks to the Relevancy Group, one of the things when we work with 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 enterprise marketers and enterprise brands is is really wanting to 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 know how much the impact of of data friction, what that what that causes for them. And so that's why we uh, we were talking to the Relevancy Group about some some research possibilities. That's where the, this came from, and we love we love partnering with them for that. So thanks for having me. Love it, love it. Th thank you, Will. And and obviously we have some great data to to share with our audience to, today about uh, data friction and and uh, data in general. So so uh, for those of you who don't know the Relevancy Group, uh, we are a market research and advisory firm. We cover uh, virtually everything under the digital marketing umbrella from marketing tactics through to uh, digital transformation. Uh, we publish also the Marketer Quarterly, which is a publication, as the name indicates, it comes out quarterly. The most recent edition features uh, excerpts from our 2019 customer data platform buyer's guide, uh, some great stuff there. It's a free download. I suggest you either go to the Marketer Quarterly Dot com or to the various app stores and download that resource. Uh, before we dig into the data, a little bit about webinar logistics. Please do submit your questions via the webinar uh, Q&A tab. We have a nice audience here today, and so we're going to focus on the Q&A uh, tab in the GoToWebinar control panel. Submit your questions there. You can also tweet us at uh, TRG Webinar Wednesday. We'll, we'll respond there uh, eventually or as soon as we can, follow us on Twitter and you will get a copy uh, of uh, the research as well as a link to today's webinar recording uh, in your inbox likely tomorrow. Um, a little bit about the survey participants before we dig into the data itself. Uh, a nice uh, survey was just in the field in August of, of this year, uh, a nice mix um, of between practitioners and leaders in the marketing organization, uh, skews a little bit senior, 21% uh, directors, uh, we have 13% CMOs, but, but a nice mix across the organization. Uh, enterprise marketers, so, so uh, uh, marketers with, with big databases, big send volumes, uh, and big budgets uh, correlating to, to uh, uh, what Will described as, as super senders, uh, primary industries here, retail, e-commerce, financial services, high tech, and travel. And so with that, uh, let's dig into some of the data. Uh, again, these, these data are featured in a, in a uh, white paper uh, that we produced uh, in partnership with Message Gears, and, and uh, you'll be receiving a copy of that. But, but to, to set us up a little bit here, uh, uh, most enterprise marketers today are driving a big percentage of their overall revenue through email, right? 
Uh, many of them, we've at the relevancy group, we have quantified the impact of email and have been for, for years. You know, many marketers are driving upwards of 20% of overall revenue through the email channel. And even those who aren't are realizing that uh, that cogent, integrated, cross-channel programs are critical to serving their customers well and, and driving positive customer experiences. And, and so almost, most of us engage with ESPs to help execute these programs. Uh, the issue is that most marketers need to replicate their customer data and synchronize their databases with ESPs regularly to, to drive personalization, to, to drive segmentation, to drive targeting. And, and unless they do this, it's tough to orchestrate these type of things internally. So, so the data we're looking at here, uh, over 84% of marketers across business verticals are leveraging an ESP to, to send their marketing. Uh, but we do see some, some interesting variants in the data. Uh, you know, those in financial services, uh, you know, fewer are, are, are replicating and, and synchronizing their data. Uh, also in, in travel and hospitality, in another area. And, and our hypothesis here at the Relevancy Group, you know, these are two areas where, where data uh, security, security, data governance, uh, uh, data management are, are really at a premium. And, and that, uh, 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 makes the choice between, you know, leveraging an ESP or not kind of uh, tougher. Um, and, and many of them are, are using in-house solutions as a result. So, so um, uh, some very interesting data here. Jeannie, uh, David, love, love to get kind of your thoughts uh, about this and, and obviously Will, you too. Um, yeah, Nick, this is uh, David. So um, I've been covering this industry since the inception, that being the ESP uh, space, sure. um, since its inception. And what I love about this piece of research and collaborating with the team, with Nick and Jeannie on it, and again, it's so wonderful to have Message Gear sponsoring the research, because I was really excited about it and the data, because for everything that I've I've ever really written on the space, I've never dug into this aspect of what is you know a normal everyday occurrence for us. Probably yeah. so much so to myself for for myself that don't I didn't think about it that much about how much time and effort we spend just slinging data around to the ESPs or the various you know cloud providers uh, in order to get our email out. And it's quite a lot of data here, as we'll, we'll get into in just a moment. And the yep. amount of time and resource that it takes is fairly tremendous. Um, so, in fact, there is a better way, um, and we'll, we'll touch on that in a bit. But um, it's, it's. Uh, I hope you enjoy the, the research paper when you do receive it tomorrow, because it's, it's one of, the, I think, one of the more interesting things, at least that I've had the opportunity to work on recently. Um, yeah, in, 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 in collaboration with the, the brilliant Jeannie Mullen and Nicholas Einstein. Um. <laughs> Thanks, David. And, um, you of know, course. I think you know, from, from my perspective and the perspective of all the CMOs and digital leaders out there is, you know, the ESPs represent to us one thing, and that's control. It is probably the one tool that, that as marketers we have control over while our data analytics teams often work with IT resources and are, are among and are split among everybody throughout the organization. The marketing team can always rely on their ESP as a source of data and sometimes the only place that they can rely on um, to get their data, but it does take significant amounts of time and effort. And as David said, you know, there, there is a better way out there that I'm super excited about talking about in just a few minutes, because it, it's something that becomes more critical as we move forward. Yep. Yeah, for, for sure. sure. Yeah. For sure. And, and, and so uh, most of us and, and most of the market, it, uh, you know, are relying on, on ESPs. Uh, and and most of us are exchanging large file with their ESPs, 
And, and here, uh, the question we've asked our panel is how large is the customer data file that you exchange with your ESP in, in, in number of records? And th there is some variance here, and, and we are looking at, at super senders, and we're looking at the mean number here, the, the, the median number uh, uh, it, we haven't shown, but, but mean files contain large numbers of customer records. And so uh, uh, increasingly big, big files being exchanged. And when we dig a little deeper, you know, it's not only numbers of records that, that are driving the volume, but it's the types of data that we're exchanging with ESPs. And so here we ask, what types of data are you exchanging with your ESP? And, and as we indicate in the research, in the, in the old days, you know, those, uh, the, the file may just have been customer records. It might've been audiences, uh, segments, uh, groups of customers that we are uploading lists that we're uploading to our ESP to, to execute uh, messaging. Today, we're, we're uh, oftentimes exchanging much deeper types of data, customer lists, 56% uh, of enterprise marketers exchanging customer lists, segments, demographic data. That's kind of what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, incrementally, purchase data, content assets, inventory files, deliverability, all these assets, what, the content assets especially. What, yeah. This is also signaling, which is, which is a really nice indicator for the industry overall, is that the sophistication of the marketer is increasing. Um, we, we certainly know the number of data assets are increasing, the complexity of the programs, the, the individualization and personalization that people are doing has risen dramatically over the last 10, 20 years. Uh, but if you think back a couple of decades, for those of you on the call that uh, recall, you know, it used to be, I mean, I remember when I started with email marketing, it was a flat file of email addresses, right? It was, it was a CSV file of email. And there's not that there's anything wrong with that, but those systems and the sort of the, 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 a legacy email service provider and marketing cloud platforms were designed to do just that. Here's an FTP drop, here's my CSV, boom. You know, it was a small, uh, lightweight file, uh, didn't take long, there wasn't a lot of complexity to it. You didn't have to sync that file necessarily with four or five other files. Yeah. But even when you think about content, with the amount of individualization and personalization that's occurring in our recent uh, uh, CDP buyer's guide goes into that in quite some detail. And again, there's an excerpt of that in the most recent version of uh, the Marketer Quarterly. Uh, we can, you can dig into some of those stats. Again, but a, a wonderful indicator that we're, that we're becoming more relevant, that we're becoming more sophisticated as marketers. And to do that, it requires more data, more content, and certainly uh, speed, right? The ability to tap into things real time, or near real time is, is more important than ever. Because yep. yep. uh, that, that past behavior is changing in seconds and hours in many cases, and, and of course across platforms, uh, hence the uh, risen complexity. Um, uh, un but, undoubtedly, uh, undoubtedly. Yeah. And, and, and we're gonna get into that in a second in terms of frequently frequency of, of data being exchanged too, because, because that's uh, changing as, you know, as fast as customer uh, demands are changing, but but uh, uh, Jeannie, will any any thoughts before we hit on that about around just the the depth of data being exchanged with with partners uh, as well as the as the breadth of it? I I think that it to echo what David just said, it's encouraging to hear uh, or to see that uh, that there's not only the volume of data is going up, the volume of records, but the types of data that's that's going into it is signaling that that uh, marketers are trying to get it right. You know, I think if you step back and ask why they're doing that, uh, it's because all of us as consumers expect those those household names or what we again we call them super senders, but enterprise marketers, the brands we've heard of before and we know and trust, we kind of expect them to get it right. 
And we expect them to be, uh, you know, to, to, to be immediate, to be accurate, and to be personal. And um, it's, it's sort of funny because for the largest brands out there that are sending all this data or that have all this data, it's hard, it's hard for them to get it right. It's, it's arguably mm-hmm. hardest for them to get it right. So you have this, you know, really high expectation trying to match with this really complicated thing. It is really interesting to see, and, and it's encouraging to see that, you know, brands are attempting to do that by by tying a lot of different data uh, sets together and data sources together. Well, and, uh, and the wonderful thing about the the future solution here of keeping your your data close to the source, um, and not moving it around, is that it's going to free up time to be more strategic. And in fact, when we asked the survey panel here, we get into this in the research paper, but if you didn't have to move data to your ESP, how would you utilize that time? And the top survey response, nearly 50% of the respondents said to improve personalization, followed by improving segmentation, which is obviously just a means to personalization. But overall, uh, 39% saying we we would like to become more strategic. So again, rather than doing sort of production-oriented tasks or being task-oriented, this frees up marketers to become more strategic and think about the offers and the audiences that they're going to put forth. Yep, that is is a fact, and and we will dig deeper there in a second, too. Uh, so, so, So along those same lines, uh, we, we hit on the kind of the depth of data, the breadth of data, uh, more data than ever, uh, uh, and increasingly uh, more sources of data. And now let's talk a little bit about the frequency of, of data exchanges. And, and these are data, um, and and I am remiss, I'm, I'm seeing I didn't include the, the question on the slide, so, so my apologies there, but we asked how often uh, you exchanged your customer data file uh, with your ESP or your external yeah, ESP partner. Uh, again, data from, from the same uh, survey of over 400 executive marketers in the field in August. And these data indicate 27% are exchanging that file daily or more frequently. Uh, I would assume there's a decent percentage of that that's doing it much more frequently and kind of on a on an ongoing kind of stream basis uh, or as you know near real time uh, but but 27 percent near daily uh, 24 percent not quite daily but every few days 36 percent a big batch just kind of doing it weekly uh, I remember as a practitioner you know th- th- that's kind of where I stood back in the day uh, you know ensuring that you're hearing can spam getting your data synced at least weekly uh, and then those who are doing it 9% monthly are, are uh, on a long tail of, of probably uh, synchronizing other stuff more frequently, but but their main customer file uh, monthly and, and really not leveraging uh, real-time stuff. And then quarterly or, or longer, you know, who knows who, who they are, but, <laughs> but, 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 but and, and some people aren't sure, um, but, but again, uh, I think the the trend here, you know, a, a lot of people still doing it weekly, um, and I think we're we're seeing. We've talked a little bit about why, you know, there are some headwinds, and, and it, it it's difficult. Um, you know, requires resources. We'll get into more of that in a minute. Um, uh, every few days, daily, increasingly, I you know, the requirement from a customer's perspective is is obviously to do it more, utilize more real time data, more contextual data, behavioral data. Um, it can be tough to synchronize that with, with your ESP. Uh, thoughts on that, Will? And, and, and yeah. Well, I think you, you kind of touched on it a little bit. Is that there's there's likely a lot of different moving parts, and 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 especially at the enterprise level, there's a lot of um, there's different different things that get synchronized and exchanged at different frequencies. So there's information that they know that they can live without having think, you know, maybe once a day, they can live with it being synced a week or, or, you know, twice a month or whatever, but then there's more immediate information that needs to be accessed more quickly, whether that's every few days, every day, even more frequently than that. And uh, that that creates a lot more complexity in the, in the setup and the program, and it just creates other opportunities for failure 
um, with with the data being wrong, with the, the the exchange not working properly or being delayed, and uh, and yeah, it just it, it sort of boxes marketers in uh, in into uh, not being able to to be flexible, right? It's very rigid. It's like okay, I can only this data is only updated every so and so. This other data is only updated every uh, every week or whatever, and that just it, it creates just even more headaches and even more challenges uh, for, for marketers. And so I think, um, again, that it, it's not just the volume of data, but it is I've got to figure out how often I need to update it. I, like you, when I uh, was on the on the brand side about 10 years ago, it was a weekly batch that we, we did an update with um, to make sure everything was synchronized. Yeah. Well, and if, you know, you think today, if we take a step back and, you know, Will, you touched on earlier the experience that consumers or customers demand I mean, data is is really the thing driving that or if we think about our digital economy or cmos that are pushing forward forward with digital transformation data is the currency and the driver to to enable all of that and so the frequency is only going to increase increase and also the amount of data that we're collecting on people uh is is, is increasing um, and we, we've got some uh, information on that, that the number of data sources that people are synchronizing with their, their email service provider uh, has increased 20% or 20, I'm sorry, excuse me, 27% over the last three years. So that's something that we track every year on our ESP buyer's guide as well. I think we cover that in the agency buyer's guide um, where, because again, sometimes even as Jeannie was sort of referring to CMOs working with IT, sometimes you don't have those internal resources. So you've got to lean on a you know, experienced email marketing agency or digital marketing agency to get those things set up and uh, and to monitor them. And you know, it, you were talking about the headaches there a little bit. Well, and when we would go beyond our um, our just ESP buyers guide in our consulting business and help buyers find solutions as part of the those uh, as part of that deliverable um, for many clients we would help them enable a sandbox environment where they could stress test their data exchanges with the prospective supplier and that was something that we suggested but that many of our buyers required and um, certainly the, the, the not all the service providers enjoyed that aspect of, of the no, bake off. No. But yeah, I mean but it's, 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 it's real it's work critical. to set that up. But no, uh, sure. but it's tremendously important. And I, I, it, I'm thinking of one fairly sophisticated marketer who's a publisher and a retailer in the in the New York uh, suburbs area. And they uh, they had just reorganized their whole data warehouse to get them they were had been exchanging something like seven files that they unified their their customer record i think it was in teradata not really totally relevant to the story but they they had unified their record and and what was used to be seven or eight feeds was now going to be one feed going to the esp so it was it was a lot of data and so they wanted to test it was new for them and they wanted to test certainly if a new provider could handle that sort of fire hose of exchange yeah. every week every couple of days right yeah that, and we're going to get into the reason why is because these data feeds fail often. And, and what we asked the, the, uh, our executive marketer panel here was how often your data feeds break. And this is, you know, fresh out of the, uh, out of the field. And these are, these are number of times per month. And there is some variance uh, across business verticals, but what we're seeing are you know, feeds, data feeds breaking in some capacity, right? Not necessarily totally breaking down, but 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 data becoming out of sync in, in some capacity or or, or feeds malfunctioning uh, uh, to, to result in, in, you know, not properly synchronized data. And and the numbers are staggering to me. Um, uh, and and you know uh, uh, represent from our perspective really big headwinds here uh you know and, and these are likely why 
those marketers on, on slide two, you know, are keeping their data uh, closer. Uh, these sort of malfunctions not only cost a marketers internally in resources to, to monitor, manage, and uh, rectify, but also, uh, you know, negatively impact customer experiences. And and I, I think as, as longtime practitioners, probably the, you know, Jeannie, me, David will as well, we can probably come up with a few interesting stories here about when data feeds are broken and, and delivered negative customer experiences to our bases, but, but it's not a laughing matter and it's a and it's a real issue and um uh and and these data specifically in this research uh uh you know were, were, sh were shocking to me um uh, thoughts for, from our panel here on, on this slide well yeah just, uh, this is Jeannie and, oh, no go, go, ahead. go Jeannie. I was I was going to say, you know, it, it costs internal resources and it impacts customer experience, but it also costs significant dollars from a revenue and a profit standpoint. And it's it's unfortunate because so many of us on the marketing side put these data feeds in some automated fashion. And by the time we get notified that the data load failed, it, it's almost too late to recover mm -hmm. from a program, especially if it's a launch or a flash sale or something that's most immediate. So this is you know, probably my favorite slide so far from the conversation that we've had because it's the scariest one and one that really um, you know just focuses on an opportunity to to correct the situation yeah I mean think about all, all the implied rework or just work to be in with there's a, uh, a beauty retailer on the west coast that we, we've done a lot of work with and um, there's a young lady on their, their marketing team who actually goes into their office on Sunday because she's she's a I mean, it's, it's a very convoluted situation, but their ESP at the time wasn't working with a Mac interface. She only had a Mac at her home. So she'd actually go into the offices on Sunday to monitor uh, the, the upload and the exchange of data so that the programs that were going off on Monday and Tuesday went off without a hitch. So here's somebody that really was making a massive, you know, diversion out of their personal life to, to go and and watch, you know, files and wheels spin. Um, yeah. And, and also, you know, I think Nick, you mentioned sort of the frequency increasing during can spam. I mean, there can also be, as Jeannie, as you point out, real, real hurt to uh, the bottom line and to revenue. But if you think about, you know, can spam compliance, there, there you could suffer potential legal or financial ramifications from from a penalty perspective, because it, you know. Well, for sure. I mean, I know in many of the brands I worked with and, and, you know, in the letter of the law, you've got to take that unsubscribe. It could come into the mail center or it could come into the call center, right? And you've got to get those flags over to the email file. And again, that's another important bit of data that's, that's uh, transferring no over. And you, no you doubt, not to mention. You don't want, yeah, I mean, and there's unfortunately been, you know, I think Bob Vila was the first case where he, he uh, didn't have his file clean and, no, I think it's four, it happens, and I think it's uh, well. We you can look up on the FTC site, but uh, can spam compliance. Yep. I think if you just Google okay. that, there's a can spam, and then and then the all the 14 other million. Oh, and then there's EU stuff, but I believe can spam is just 14 million dollar fine per instance. It's, so it's, yeah. you gotta, if you're so, a super so, center and you have a large file, it could it could really break the bank. There's exposure. There's exposure, yeah. and and yeah. so. Uh, another area where we're talking about resources being uh, consumed and allocated is around just integration in general. And, and uh, many of us uh, presenting on the panel and, and many of us in the audience have, have been through uh, integration uh, uh, projects. And, and the question we asked our executive marketer panel here was how long did it take to get your data fully integrated to your marketing cloud implementation and and the mean uh the mean here uh is in an, is you know just under a year uh mm. but many uh take take far longer and and and, and you know uh, david and i and, and and Jeannie have worked on many that that have, have been big complex implementations they take uh f for even uh um, relatively um modest or you know even even if you're not a super sender, 
integrations are difficult when you're a super sender and have a lot of data integrated across the marketing org and beyond the marketing org, right? It's, it's not all living in marketing. It's living, uh, uh, you know, across the, the enterprise. Um, when, when it comes to integrating that fully with the marketing solution, uh, the resources, the time adds up. And, and it's, we, we've heard horror stories of people, you know, uh, uh, renewing contracts before they've been fully implemented. And so um, it, it's not, it's not a, a trivial issue. It's an issue uh, uh, and, and, and uh, you know, digital transformation is difficult. You know, integrating a new, a new platform is difficult. Um, these sort of changes to the marketing stack are particularly painful because uh, they they impact you know customer experience and in many cases uh, they're very costly. People are operating platforms uh, in tandem, uh, migrating data over time. You know, paying two big vendors uh, to uh, uh, you know third parties, internal resources. Uh, it, it can be very painful and it can take a lot of time. Um, mm -hmm. And we, we, we should mention, not to sound completely doom and gloomy, but we, we, we talk about this in our uh, uh, ESP buyer's guide that came out, I guess it was in January of 2019, I think, right, Nick? And that was the last one. And again, you can uh, yep. find that in, I think, issue 21 or issue 22 of the Marketer Quarterly, the excerpt of that. But what we talk about there is as, you know, uh, there is some fantastic uh, advancements in technology databases that deal with unstructured data. And so there's a new category of ESPs that we talk about in the research, uh, stream-based ESPs uh, and, and message gears. We, we put them in that category where they're taking data in real time, sort of capturing things in flight and building a profile in real time about that customer doing the segmentation and the individualization in real time. So there's there's some fantastic advancements, again, based on database technology that's not necessarily, not necessarily always structured data. So things like um, Snowflake, which Message Gears, I know you, you think in your last release, you did a big announcement around many of the new t different types of database technology that you guys are integrating with. So, so that makes, you know, changes sort of the value proposition for, for many of the providers and also changes the paradigm in terms of how we would approach our week or our day job. Um, and so there are, there are remedies of, of doing it rather than doing it sort of on technology that was built in, or designed in you know, 1990 and was scaled up in 2004 or something, right? Because if you think about it, a lot of, yep. and I'm not slamming the, the ESPs out there, there are certainly many um, good and um, workable solutions out there, but many of them, were designed you know, 20 years ago, um, or, yep. and, and some have been redesigned. And again, we cover that in our in our, in our buyer's guide. Yeah. Where there's yeah, been some sure. either acquisitions or roll-ups, and they've they've invested a ton of money to rebuild some of these platforms, so they could be competitive with some of the newer uh, solutions like a message cares. I mean that's yep. so. I mean, it's yeah, really driving, sure. like, like like any industry, there's a lot of change that's being driven from the innovation, sort yep. of bubbling up. Yeah. That, that, that is a fact, that is a fact. And and uh, ultimately we've hit here today on, on a bunch of, of kind of headwinds and, and resources required to, to kind of integrate, time required. And and here for, for our, our last slide before hitting uh, into into a little bit of Q &A, uh, uh, and A and a little discussion about message here are some opportunity costs. What what would executor marketers and D David, you hit on this a minute ago. Um, you know, what would we do if we had the time to to allocate a, a, the time back? Uh, had our data closer? The question we're asking: If we didn't have to to move and replicate our data with our ESP, how would we utilize that time and those resources? Uh, improving personalization, improving segmentation, becoming more strategic, the top three, uh, testing, retargeting, optimization, you know, uh, ultimately, if marketers, these data indicate, if marketers 
could could have the time back, could could, could have their data closer, uh, they would be doing a lot of very worthwhile things, uh, things that that we've uh, uh, quantified at the relevancy group, improving personalization. We just launched a piece uh, this month around the ROI of advanced personalization, over $20 returned for, for every dollar in, invested in advanced personalization. And so those, those dollars spent, those resources spent towards integration and replication and synchronizing data, you know, for some marketers, they could be better spent uh, in other places, potentially delivering greater ROI on those investments. Uh, thoughts on, the, on that, Jeannie? Or or will or or, or the rest of the I, panel? Yeah. I have I have so many thoughts, uh, but but yeah, this, I mean this um, this sort of um, we we did some in-house research earlier this year at Message Gears where it echoed this very same thing. It was the topic around operational inefficiencies and how that impacts job satisfaction for for marketers and particularly in the email space, right? The most of, I'm a marketer, uh, you know, most marketers got into this to be strategic and creative. And it's not that we right. don't necessarily dislike some of the operational things that we do. And some people turn that into a career. But when it, you're talking about operational inefficiencies that, that are needless uh, and that are barriers and that don't need to be there, preventing you from being strategic, being creative, uh, doing some really innovative things and some fun things. Um, that's a problem, and it impacts not just the customers, but again, it impacts job satisfaction. And you know, there are people that um, you know were on teams where they were they were siloed because of the tech being siloed, and all this stuff was inefficient. And they were asked if they wanted to go into email marketing again, if they if they had the chance to start over. And a lot of them said no. Um, so there's you know, a lot of us want to be strategic, want to improve personalization, segmentation, and feel like the technology. And, and the inefficiencies created around moving data back and forth is um, is a real barrier to that. It's just I've got to keep the trains running and less about where should the train go next. And I think that is um, – that's just it, – it's, it's I love this slide for that reason. I, I, I hate the fact that there's so many that feel stuck and feel that, uh, you know, they're, they're, they want to do more as a marketer. And and feel like their their hands are tied in a lot of these ways. Right. Yeah. yeah. And, and interestingly, with that is, um, you know, I see this slide, and it almost opens up a whole other set of issues, which is when the data feeds fail, when your data is only being transferred weekly for whatever reason, then you are almost forced into creating personalization, segmentation, and other elements for your email program around what the data will allow you to do. You know, so, so it's not like we can even sit down and create the most incredible customer journeys or look at customer experiences effectively because we're so limited by, here's what we would do in a perfect world, but by the way, the data only goes up once weekly and every third week it fails. And on top of that, you're spending all this time. It's, it's less of a question around, you know, what would you be doing if you had all this time back? I think that I think the number one answer and, and it's the collective answer of all of these is what actually create customer experiences and journeys that make sense from the beginning? You know, like it, it's it's um, it's almost, you know, sad that that we're that that like the robot, the data robot gods have taken over and forced us <laughs> to do to, to email market based on what they allow us to have, you know, access to and parameters. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. No, I, I you hear you. Think yeah. of the, uh, the, 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 that comment makes me think of the end of uh, the Planet of the Apes when the Statue of Liberty is there. Charles and Heston is there. We go. There we go. What, have we, uh, what have we done? Well, I don't, think we're, I don't think we're there yet. Yeah. I don't think we're there yet. I don't think we're there yet. This is encouraging right. because, I mean, just even the testing, right? We, we've been banging on this drum for, for years is that you know, testing is such a Nat necessary and natural part of marketing, and so few do it. I mean, we, we, I think our other data shows that it's about half of marketers test, the other half obviously don't. And Jeannie and I uh, wrote a book about 
I guess now 10 or 12 years ago, Jeannie, the book on email marketing. And so it's, it's back then, I think it was about a third of people were testing or doing segmentation. Um, so it's, it's nice to see the progress, but yeah, you've got to get these sort of operational barriers out of the way so you can be more strategic. Yeah, and and people, yeah, people, thirty four percent would like to if the data wasn't wasn't an issue. So so, uh, Will, thank you to Message Gears for, for sponsoring uh, this research. Some some really enlightening stuff here. We have uh, uh, the white paper, and, and and everyone on the line is going to be getting a, a copy of the white paper, um, which will hit on. Some of the some of the uh, differentiators and, and some of the issues uh, that we just touched on today. Um, uh, question for, for you, and 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 invite the audience here. We do have time for for a couple questions here. We have uh, we are running low on time, but but um, in terms of will message gears enabling super senders we touched on it at the beginning um what does that what does that really mean and and do you have an example you can share or maybe a couple examples of kind of uh, what the message gear solution enables for for, for a super sender and we have several yeah. online i'm sure yeah no uh we so we we're all about solving problems for the enterprise level we that that is our client base we do not work uh, with, uh, you know, small businesses or mid-tier. I mean, it is large, what we, again, call super senders, uh, and, and all about trying to find solutions that help them deliver better experience to their customers. And a lot of that does go back to data access and data proximity, if you will. And right. uh, so we are all about, uh, you know, saying, look, you know, tech should liberate, not limit, right? Tech should should do its job, get out of the way, and let the marketer be be creative. And and we go back again to knowing that it is very hard for for enterprise brands to to get things right. And a lot of that has to do with just how they're they're getting to their data. And so, um, you know, typically the best use case uh, and, and a lot of our success stories come of that is there's a, a modernization process that that brands are going through where they're doing a few things. First, they're consolidating their data somewhere, right? They've got disparate sources all over the place. They know that they they need to get that data in one place. Um, and at the super sender level, it's not going to be their their marketing cloud or their ESP. And and so they're they're consolidating it many times into uh, what's what's gotten really popular the last several years, maybe four or five years even, uh, would be cloud cloud data warehouses, modern data warehouses. So an Amazon, a Google, um, Snowflake, uh, Azure, something like that, where where they can get a 360 view of their customer uh, and and still have that control and scalability is is uh, a lot of a lot of companies are, are thinking through uh, when they're trying to do this in in a private cloud environment like that. And then you know the problem then comes, which we've talked about today a lot, and this research helped uncover, is that they're modernizing, but then a lot of brands still have to then because the tools out in the marketplace still require you to send them data. Um, there, there are inefficiencies created there where they're taking this nice, shiny, modern cloud data warehouse and still having to sync data back and forth to their ESP, which was built for a world that was much different, as David said, you know, 20 years ago. Uh, so what Message Gears does is instead of requiring that synchronization, we attach to wherever your data already lives. And so as you're building audiences, as you're doing your personalization, your segmentation, we're giving you live access to that data. We're leaving it as the, the database of record, not requiring any synchronization or, or replication. And so that's what I, I've been, you know, with this company and helped build this company for the last five years. It's, um, we're all very passionate about uh, evangelizing data access and, and close proximity to data as, as such a, a key driver because we've seen it over and over again. Rakuten Rewards, uh, which again used to be eBay, um, you know, they, they consolidated their data into one source, uh, and, and we've seen now as they've moved to message gears from from a cloud ESP uh, that uh, they're they're able. In fact, their VP of Analytics is like, look, the tech just kind of gets out of the way, and we can start doing things that we didn't think were possible before. 
Um, and, and going back a little bit to the implementation issues, um, you know, we were able to, to stand them up very quickly within a matter of, of days where, uh, you know, typically things take months. Uh, to, to migrate. And, and so, of course, you still have training and you still have program migration, but uh, you, you eliminate all of the complexities up front with, with uh, the wires having to, uh, to, to get plugged in across channels, if you will. Um, so we've seen Ebates with, with huge returns. Uh, you know, Expedia has been a client of ours for years. Uh, they, they saw 100% ROI um, on the email channel. Uh, Chick-fil-A with that data access is able to really get very, very personalized. They do a lot of uh, a lot of store specific emails and, and messaging uh, and, and are looping and push. So it's just it's it's really it's been invigorating for me to see that that close proximity and that complete access has really opened up these marketers to be more strategic, to be more creative and ultimately to, to pass that on to their customers who who are, you know, you want to. Surprise and delight your customers on the other end, and uh, and hope to uh, over over deliver on their expectations. And and uh, that's a lot of a lot of marketers tend to think it's the tool that they they need when really it's access to their data that that is the most important. Right. Yep. Yep. And 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 uh, great way to to wrap that up this up, Will. Uh, we've now pushed over over our, our, a lot of time by about 20 minutes. Thank everyone for joining us. Uh, really, really great stuff, Jeannie, David, uh, Will. For more uh, info on this, you'll be seeing an email in your inbox tomorrow, uh, copy of the of the research as well as a link to the webinar. Uh, thank you for joining us today, uh, Will. Thank you and Message Gears for sponsoring the research. Uh, Jeannie, David, again, thank you, and and to our audience, thank you very much, and looking forward to uh, touching base again on another webinar Wednesday. We have another great one coming up next week. So thank you again, and uh, thank you very much to our panel. Thank you. Happy Halloween. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Goodbye. Right. Thank you, Will. Thank you, Jeannie and Nick. Um, yeah, it's great content. And for all of you out there still listening, if you have questions that we didn't get to, you could certainly tweet to us, direct message us there on the Twitter, or uh, or if uh, ask at therelevancygroup.com, that'll come into our general inquiry box, and um, we'll, we'll certainly get back to you if we didn't cover something that you're uh, interested in discussing. Uh, and certainly you. as you uh, get the paper and the recording tomorrow, uh, it may stimulate some additional questions. So feel free to reach Indeed. out to us at any time. Indeed. Right. Great stuff. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful webinar Wednesday. Take care. <laughs>